The weather-beaten OS-35 wreck will now be transported to Holland and scrapped. The OS-35 can finally say goodbye to the Rock of Gibraltar. A storm with no name unleashes three times as much rain as Hurricane Katrina. We're talking about an unimaginable amount of water. Suddenly, entire neighborhoods are inundated. 80% of the parish went underwater. So many rescues, we have a hard time keeping up. A desperate family, trapped by floodwaters, cling to the railings of a house, praying for rescue. They're trying to hold on to each other. I just prayed, and I really thought that I was dying that day. Livingston Parish, 30 miles east of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. A suburb with more than 400 miles of rivers and bayous. A sportsman's dream. The geography changes from a farming area in the north to um, lots of waterways in the southern part of the parish. I always describe it as a hidden paradise. We actually can get into Lake Pontchartrain or anywhere we want to in the world by water leaving this parish. Friday, August 12th, 2016. Livingston Parish Sheriff Jason Ard is up at 6 a.m. to get on the road. It's been raining all night and traffic is likely to be slow. You're gonna hopefully not be slipping and sliding on the streets here because of all the rain that's coming down. Now the bulk of the activity... We knew there was some heavy rain coming and it was a storm, but it was a regular thunderstorm. We've seen our fair share of storms here in Livingston Parish for sure. All the same, when Jason's wife, Erica, peeks outside, she's surprised by the amount of water she sees. I remember my wife looking out the window and saying, uh, oh my God, we have water everywhere. And so me being the husband just says, yeah, whatever. You know, I've been here a long time. I mean, it's just normal, we're gonna have water. We've always had little small storms that would cause some type of high water, a few little rescues here and there. So I get up and walk and look outside and I'm like, oh, that's a lot of water. I mean, it just started raining around midnight and it's already water all the way around my house. Once Jason is on the road, his concern grows. Driving down this road, I noticed there was several vehicles underwater. In all of the storms and floods and rescues I've done, I've never ever had a problem in this area. Something's not right. 30 miles west at WAFB-TV in Baton Rouge, Jay Grimes is also worried about the weather. The chief meteorologist has watched this system creep west-northwest across Louisiana. As a weather forecaster, we're already anticipating this is going to be a wet event. No surprise, flash flood watch in effect through Saturday morning for our area, and that'll probably be extended deeper into the weekend. Now, the unnamed storm has stalled over the Baton Rouge and Lafayette area, unleashing up to three inches of rainfall an hour. It wasn't until it's sitting on us that people realize this is going to be a bigger problem than we anticipated. Meteorologists are watching the storm closely. But across the state, the news doesn't get as much attention as it deserves. The problem for folks in Louisiana is it never got a name. We name storms based upon wind, not rain. This storm, it walked like a duck, it quacked like a duck. It was tropical, but it never earned the attention of the media as a tropical system. In East Baton Rouge, Addison Botis and her mother, Michelle, get word that the first day of school has been canceled because of the weather. I was really excited to start school. Um, I had moved to that school in the middle of fourth grade and I had my uniform picked out, my new shoes and stuff. The next day, Saturday, August 13th, 6 a.m., Michelle, her husband Ben, and their four kids wake up to another day of relentless rain and rising floodwaters. It was kind of odd, but that's how it was the day before what you would think of as like really rainy, you know, bad weather. Ben starts to head out for work and quickly comes back inside. 
he made it a little way out and he said, I just don't think it's safe, you know, that I go to work today. But he said, I just will kind of stay at home and maybe try to go in in a little while. Two hours later, the water is even higher. The Botis family watches as their backyard floods at an alarming rate. I said, well, there's more water than there was last night, so let's just try to pack a few things, and then we'll try to go to our parents' house kind of a little further west. We're, like, picking up all the stuff off the ground and, like, putting it on higher, like, places so they wouldn't get as ruined. We packed up a few things. I say a few things. Really, we filled my husband's truck <laughs> with stuff. Our kids each got a bag, a little Tupperware full of their important things, and our two dogs and their dog kennels and leashes. Evacuating their home, Michelle's husband, Ben, maneuvers their 4x4 truck through rising water. Within blocks, the street becomes a swift-moving river, and their truck stalls. That's where the water overtook the truck and came over the top of the truck. We could feel the water just coming in really fast, and we felt it at, like, our feet, and then again at our ankles and our waist. My mom was in the passenger seat with my little brother. Even though, like, she was very worried, she was able to be like, hey, it's okay, we're going to be okay. We were all very panicked, and I was scared, and all my siblings were really scared, too. This no-name storm continues to drench the Baton Rouge area. The big threat really is going to be the rain, and that continues. And all these counties outlined in green, those are flash flood warnings, where we've had immense amounts of rain already falling. The Livingston Parish Sheriff's Office is fielding hundreds of calls for help. 911, where's your emergency? We got water coming in the house, and I can't seem to get out. 911, where's your emergency? Water just bumped through the door. It was just rescue after rescue. We were behind from the very beginning, and we're losing. We never lose in Livingston Parish, but it was at a magnitude we could not keep up. As the first responders become overwhelmed, units rush in from sheriff's offices across Louisiana. And local citizens jump in to save stranded victims. Oh, my God, I'm drowning. Get my dog. Get my dog. Get my dog. Oh, I got your dog. Oh. oh. I remember we had so many calls coming in, two or three hundred people were trying to be rescued. Then Sheriff R gets an urgent call saying his own 911 center is underwater. And when I walk in, all the dispatchers, Every single one of them have their pants rolled up, and they steadily taking calls. 911, where's your emergency? I'm in about nine foot, ten foot, maybe more than that of water. The house feels like it's coming off the slab. It was just getting scary because Mother Nature was wreaking havoc upon Livingston Parish at this moment. And those six members of the Botus family from East Baton Rouge are all stuck in this 4x4, sinking rapidly in the floodwaters. My husband, I could hear him just saying, I can't get the door open, I can't get the door open. I kept thinking, what about my kids? You know, we've got to get them out. Baton Rouge, Louisiana, August 2016. A no-name storm is dumping a record amount of rainfall. We've never seen anything even close to it, nothing remotely uh, as big as this flood event. All across the Baton Rouge area, rivers rise to astonishing levels. The governor of Louisiana dispatches the National Guard. Because of this historic flooding event, I've been issued uh, by me yesterday a statewide emergency declaration. We didn't just break the record, we totally smashed it. And that's where you started seeing places that you would have said this place will never flood, did in fact flood. In East Baton Rouge, Michelle Botis and her family are stranded in the floodwaters after evacuating from their house. Their pickup is about to be submerged. Michelle's youngest son, Brennan, sits on her lap. She knows they have to get out of the truck, but the flow of water has jammed the door shut. My husband, I could hear him just saying, I can't get the door open, I can't get the door open. I kept thinking, what about my kids? You know, we've got to get them out. I was nervous. My siblings were like crying and they were like really scared. I was trying to like help them, like reassure them that it's gonna be okay. 
But there was some sort of a tool, thankfully, my husband had in the truck. I was able to break the window to let out some of the pressure, and then we were able to, to get out. They scramble out of the truck and into a surge of rushing water that's nearly five feet high. The water was probably around neck level to me. In between houses, the current was really, really strong, so it actually swept us off of our feet. On the north end of Livingston Parish, the Amit River Basin crests and a wave of water surges into nearby neighborhoods. Even the first responders are in trouble. Major Perry Rushing got a call that Saturday morning from his brother, who lives next door, saying both of their houses are about to flood. I went to bed thinking that the crest would occur and water levels would be at five, six feet below being a threat to my home. And Saturday morning, I realized my home was going to flood, which was just unfathomable. In the area where I live is a dead-end road. I said, there are probably 100 households here that are going to flood. I called the sheriff's office dispatch center and said, hey, I need help. I'm flooded in. And I was told, you're not getting it. The, the parish is under such flooding conditions that there are just not enough resources. The first thought that I entered, this is historic flooding and people are going to die. Let's get out here and do something about it. Perry and his wife pack up their essentials. Then he and his brother set out to help evacuate the neighborhood. They spend the next several hours helping neighbors get to higher ground. At the 911 center in Livingston Parish, the water has risen to dangerous levels, but the phones keep ringing. 911, where's your emergency? This is the second time I called. We're flooded in. We're going to drown in here if somebody doesn't come. It's up to our knees. It's running well, very fast. I understand, ma'am. We're trying to get them there as soon as we can. 911, where's your emergency? Yes, we're on Highway 43 and we're stuck on top of our AC wheeler. You see lights, but I don't know if they can call. But they're going to get there so you can see the lights. We're so cold. I know. I understand, ma'am. Trust me. Just stay calm. And what was truly amazing is that if you were the caller that was calling in, you'd have never known that. Uh, Ma'am, what do you need? Sheriff Jason Ard makes a critical decision to close the center and then quickly reopen it on higher ground. We knew we had to shut down this center because we just were losing a battle. They set up an impromptu switchboard at a nearby command post. Then Sheriff Ard flips a switch and powers down the 911 center. We were actually lost communications maybe two or three minutes. Had to drag three or four dispatchers away from there because they did not want to leave and told them it was going to be okay. But I remember just taking a sigh of relief because you have over four or 500 people calling you to be rescued and you want to be there. Back in East Baton Rouge, the Botis family, Michelle, Ben, and their four kids, have escaped from their truck, but are now in danger of drowning as they try to find higher ground. He was knocking all of us over, and my little brother couldn't touch, so my sister, my older sister, was trying to carry him. Ben Botis pushes through the floodwaters to the back of the truck to free the dogs from their crates. He grabs a handful of ratchet straps before the truck bed fills with water. He was able to tie some of us together because the current was really, really bad. Then, the Botus family form a chain and make their way to the front porch of a nearby house. We were all like floating waves. We were trying to hold on to each other to get to the higher ground. So like my mom was in the front walking to like the porch because that's the only place that we could go. Someone in the neighborhood happens to snap this photo of the Botus family truck as it's nearly submerged in the floodwaters. Michelle and her family have managed to escape the truck, but they're still trapped by the raging flood. I had to rely on God because I really didn't think that we were going to be able to make it. This September, revolutionary ideas and groundbreaking technology take center stage in New York City for Climate Week. We need to commit to drastic measures, both the long and short term. Stephanie Abrams provides you a front row pass. This year is all about getting it done. Climate Week starts Monday only on the Weather Channel and Pattern.
Saturday, August 13th, 2016. An unprecedented flood is devastating South Louisiana. It's deep as hell back there. In Livingston Parish, sheriff's deputies, the National Guard, and an army of volunteer first responders scramble to evacuate entire neighborhoods. We have rescued hundreds and hundreds of people from the parish and put them in a shelter. And now those shelters are taken on water. I mean, 85 to 90% of the parish was underwater. 30 miles away in East Baton Rouge, areas that never flood are engulfed by water. Michelle Botis, her husband Ben, and their children barely managed to escape their truck as it was overtaken by floodwaters. Now stranded and desperate, they cling to the wooden post of a nearby house. We were able to hold on to the column. It was cold and nasty, and there were like a bunch of like piles of fire ants. Throughout the ordeal, Michelle has somehow managed to keep her purse strapped to her shoulder. She had a bunch of stuff in it, and like, I don't really know how she kept holding on to it, because like, I could barely hold on to my stuff. I had just a few percent left on my phone, and I actually posted on Facebook, and I said, boats needed, and the name of our subdivision. Then they huddled together in the cold, filthy brown water, and watched the water rise. If I'm honest, I really thought that I was dying that day. Um, when the water was coming up, in fact, I called my mom and I told my mom goodbye because I didn't think that we were gonna be able to make it out. And I just prayed and I prayed that my kids would be safe and that they would make it. In Livingston Parish, rescuers are just starting to get a handle on the situation. You're okay. We started winning and getting these rescues, getting people what they need. We had a lot of people coming in from all over. Holy cow. We'll go back out this way. How far can we go? As the hours pass in East Baton Rouge, Michelle and her family are still clinging to a porch column to avoid being swept away when they hear someone calling Michelle's name. I didn't really know who he was at all. He had come with a boat and was like, hey, Michelle, like I'm here to rescue y'all. A friend of Michelle's from high school had seen her message on Facebook and come in his boat to rescue them. When I heard my name and then we're here to help your family get out, I was just so joyous because I really didn't think that we would ever leave the columns of that house. He takes the family to a gas station on higher ground a mile down the road. The National Guard then drives them to a spot where other family members can pick them up. At the time, we were worried, but it was cool to see how my family works in like a stressful situation. By the time the no-name storm moves on, it takes the lives of 13 people and causes about $15 billion in damages. By the time it was over, there were more properties outside of the flood zone that took water than properties inside the flood zone. And there's over 100,000 properties that were inundated, fewer than half of them had flood insurance. Singer Beyonce and her family hold a benefit to raise money for those affected by the floods in Baton Rouge. And Taylor Swift donates a million dollars to Louisiana's relief fund. In Livingston Parish, thousands are rescued by a league of first responders that includes local citizens and the National Guard. We had the Cajun Navy, we had military, we just had so many people coming together to help. And they were truly inspiring. They just came because they knew what was going on, and we survived it because we did it together. Michelle Botis and her family are among the 60,000 Louisianans whose homes were damaged or destroyed by floodwaters. Somehow, by the grace of God, we actually had flood insurance on the structure of our home, but not the contents. It was like a week after where I finally got to go home, but other people had already been to their houses, and so you could see all the trash and stuff on the street. When we came back, the way that the community helped was so remarkable, and 98% of our community flooded. But yet, everyone was helping everyone. They were at my house helping one day, and we were at their house helping the next day. Michelle says it took a long time for her kids to overcome the terrors of the 2016 flood. 
but she also believes the experience has deepened their understanding of life. It was really difficult for them. Every time it rained, um, they were very nervous. They were very scared, but now they're great. Um, they realize the blessings that the flood sent us. They saw our community work together in ways that were just tremendous. They have such servants' hearts now. They look for ways to be the helpers in difficult situations. Coming up, a small town sleeps, unaware that an EF4 tornado is headed right at them. In the dark of night, a powerful tornado roars toward a small town. You only get a few glimpses of where it is and how big it is. Three football fields. Why? Within minutes, it's barreling right into a community that's fast asleep. It sounded like you were at the back of an airplane getting ready to take off. I started hovering. It was starting to take me away, and it was literally me taking off into the sea. Harrisburg, Illinois, just 50 miles north of Paducah, Kentucky. This was once a coal mining mecca with a bustling downtown. Today, it's a much quieter area, population 9,000. People are farmers. There are lots of coal miners, although many of them have lost their jobs. Our schools play each other in sports, and a lot of us go to church together. Doug Cottom owns the local bowling alley, named after his late father, Ross. Ross Cottom Lanes has been here in Harrisburg for over 50 years. Stacy's my wife. She came to work for us, and then uh, oh, we started dating two or three years after that. She's my right arm in this operation. She's a rock. As the owner of the town's most popular hangout, Doug seems to know just about everyone. At this stage, I'm seeing children of parents that I used to do business with a long time ago, and now I'm seeing their kids and their kids. February 2012. 22-year-old Jaylyn Farrell is one of the kids who hung out at the bowling alley. She's just started a nursing job at the Harrisburg Medical Center and is renting her first house on the same street where the Cottoms live. They're duplexes. There's actually 10 different units there with two in each. Everybody knows everybody. It's just a couple blocks from the hospital, and she was so excited. Jay Lynn's parents, Patty and DJ, live 14 miles outside of Harrisburg in the town of Herod. We got to pick out furniture and set up her first house, and we held Christmas there. So we were really excited about that. It's funny because when you have children, they're all different. And Jaylynn, she wanted to be out on her own. Well, I wasn't too thrilled about that. Why pay rent when you could stay home and it didn't cost you anything? That was my opinion on it. And she'd be there, I'd get to see her every day. <laughs> we weren't worried. I mean, we hated it. I mean, her dad especially, she's a daddy's girl, so I mean, he would have had her to stay to live forever at our house. February 28th, a typically quiet Tuesday. The only thing out of the ordinary is the weather. In fact, everyone is talking about it. Harrisburg is in the middle of a strange winter heat wave that's making people anxious. Stacy made the comment that day was so soupy outside that that eerie feeling you get like man it's it's a, too warm for the month of february it was really strange because of course i'm a school teacher so for several days at school we were taking the kids out they're not wearing jackets it's just really odd 70 degrees in february in southern illinois is never a good thing some of our strongest tornadoes have occurred in november january and february there's an upward motion. That's a really strong tornado. Tracy Felty is the county's 911 director and a meteorologist. He knows this region of Illinois has an ominous history of tornadoes. We're right there on the edge of Tornado Alley. Therefore, you need all the ingredients come together right here on top of us. Storms in the southern states are often pushed by a stronger jet stream than those in Tornado Alley to the west. When twisters strike here, they tend to move faster and stay on the ground longer. 
We have the history of the Tri-State Tornado. That was almost 100 years ago. It started out of Missouri, across the state of Illinois, and into Indiana. The 1925 Tri-State Tornado was a deadly EF-5, stretching more than a mile wide. It tore a 219-mile path across the region and killed more than 500 people in southern Illinois. It's still the record longest tornado on the ground. You can go back and look at the history, and you'll see some tornadoes that follow close to those same paths. Oh yeah, it's on the ground, look at it. This heat wave in February 2012 is part of a much larger storm system developing on the southern plains. So here's a look at where we could see severe weather through the day today. Majority of these storms are moving eastbound 60 to 70 miles an hour. We are under a tornado warning here. We actually had a conference call with the Weather Service discussing the potential for severe weather. There are certain times during the year we have all the ingredients for a tornado to occur. And that's what we had that morning. For the past year, Tracy has been working with the county sheriff, Keith Brown, to implement a new weather alert system called Nixel. Tracy found Nixle, and Nixle is a cell phone text message operation. And we went around to the different places in the community and, and tried to get people to do that. 11 a.m., 800 miles northwest of Harrisburg in North Platte, Nebraska. A weak tornado touches down. It does minimal damage, but it's the first February twister ever recorded in the Cornhusker state. Throughout the day, more supercells form across the region, moving steadily toward Illinois as night falls. That evening, Patty and DJ Farrell call their daughter, Jay Lynn, who's traveling back from a nursing conference in Indiana. I remember Patty was talking to her on the phone, and she might have mentioned to her that there were storm warnings. Her boyfriend lived near Evansville, Indiana. He had actually talked to her about, you know, why don't you get a hotel or whatever? She said, no, no, I'm going to go home. I'm going to be home. In their duplex, a few doors down from Jay Lynn's, Doug and Stacy Cottom are unconcerned about the weather. I typically watch the news, the 10 o'clock news here, and nothing out of the ordinary. There was a chance for some rain, but nothing imminent, if you will. Stacy got home about 11. We were in bed by 11.30, quarter to 12. Shortly after midnight, there's yet another twister. This one an EF-2 in Branson, Missouri, 360 miles southwest of Harrisburg. The overnight period is the worst time period to have something because most people are asleep. They're not listening to TV or radio. The tornado rips through the heart of Branson's popular live entertainment and tourist district leaving six theaters damaged and several homes destroyed. The only known video of it passing in the dark is this one, recorded on a parking lot surveillance camera. February 29th, leap day. Just before 5 a.m. near the neighboring village of Carrier Mills, Illinois, an EF-4 tornado with wind speeds of 180 miles per hour touches down. Under the cover of darkness, it's nearly undetectable. It was a very rain wrapped tornado. It was a wedge-shaped tornado. So you only get a few glimpses of where it is and how big it is. At 4.45 a.m., Doug and Stacy Cottom are jolted awake. Two things stood out to us. One, the hail hitting the window. There was no question that's what woke us up. And our phones are going off. Both of our phones were on the nightstands. It's a Nixle alert warning that tornadoes are in the area. And I went to my iPad and I said, I'm gonna look at the radar and see what we got. And as almost as soon as I picked the iPad up, we heard the sirens. Stacy grabs hold of their Maltese named Pinsky as they rush for the bathroom. People always say it sounds like a freight train. Well, to me and Stacy, it sounded like you were at the back of an airplane getting ready to take off and going down the runway. Stacy seeks cover in the tub with Pinsky in her arms. And then the sound that really got to us immediately was everybody's heard a nail being pulled out of a, a board. Well, imagine about a thousand of those nails being pulled out at one time. I literally started hovering, 
It was starting to take me away, and then I told Stacy I loved her. I said, but we're in big time trouble. Just before dawn on Leap Day, February 29th, 2012, an EF-4 tornado is bearing down on Harrisburg, Illinois. Tracy Felty, the county's 911 director, has just gotten word that the twister is on the ground. When I started driving, the rain was going horizontal. That's not a good sign. I was behind the storm the whole time and was unable to see the tornado. And I'm like, I think I need to be in front of this. He races into Harrisburg, where the twister is already shredding homes into toothpicks and flattening a strip mall. It extended up to three football fields wide. We had winds of 180 miles an hour. Didn't have a lot of time to react. Doug and Stacy Cottom have taken shelter in the bathroom of their duplex as the twister roars down their block. She was laying flat on her back in the tub with a dog on her stomach. The last thing that Stacy saw was literally me taking off into the ceiling. That's the last I remember. I blacked out as soon as I started spinning and took off. The tornado decimates an entire section of the neighborhood and rips across the parking lot of a nearby Walmart. We had winds that lifted air conditioners off of the top of the Walmart building. They were dropping these on top of houses. You have a bank building that was destroyed because of the bricks from the church across the street pelting it. My path was stopped because there was a building sitting in the middle of the roadway. And my first thought is, where did this building come from? Kind of panned around, and where the Lutheran church was setting, it was totally gone. The twister also slams into the Harrisburg Medical Center, caving in a portion of the building. Like Tracy Felty, Saline County Sheriff Keith Brown is heading into Harrisburg. I was about a half mile at the most from one of the first places in the city that was hit. I came in on the backside of it. You could see trees and lots of debris. As I arrived closer to the scene, what looked like a bomb had went off, and houses were leveled, and people hollering. As I walked up the street, then there was this uh, huge mound of debris that was set of apartments. That was where we received the most impact. 14 miles south of Harrisburg, DJ Farrell turns on the morning news. And they were talking about storms coming through and the shopping center next to Walmart had been hit and was destroyed. And Jalen's place was right behind that. I told Patty, I said, you better get up. We better go up there. Kids of any age, they always have their phone with them, usually in the bed. So I immediately jump up, start texting her, and get no response. We throw clothes on, and we start heading up there. And, you know, in the entire time, I'm texting her, I'm texting her, get nothing. We just head to town, and we turn on the street towards Water Street. We can see fire trucks everywhere, and then we can see just that there's nothing that there's nothing, there's nothing there. You could see that there was nothing left of the house but her car sitting where the garage was. I was probably thinking the worst. The tornado has thrown Doug Cottom and a giant section of his house more than 125 yards. As the dust settles in a nearby field, Doug regains consciousness and opens his eyes. When I came to, I knew immediately that I had survived it. I was buried. I could not physically pull myself out because it was just it was too much stuff on me. And I thought, man, I hope I can move my legs. He tries yelling for his wife, Stacy. I was out of breath because I'd hit the turf, and I, I was yelling as loud as I could for her, and then the dog comes up to me. It's Pinsky, their beloved Maltese, who Stacy had been holding in the bathtub when the tornado struck. He was walking over glass and boards and nails, and so I grabbed him. You could start to see that it was getting daylight. It was very quiet, eerily quiet. 
I assumed that Stacy was gone. February 29th, Leap Day 2012. An EF-4 tornado with winds up to 180 miles per hour has ravaged Harrisburg, Illinois. Trapped in a pile of rubble, Doug Cottom holds his dog, Pinsky, and calls out for his wife, Stacy. I was blood from head to toe, so I immediately made him red. I mean, literally, he was a white dog, and I made him red. And then Stacy came crawling and kind of half walking over. Stacy was tossed about 40 yards away, along with the tub from their bathroom. She immediately saw Pinsky and freaked out a little bit because he was red, and I had a hard time convincing her that that was my blood on the dog. And I tell the story that she was more concerned for the dog, but she was equally concerned for me. EMTs are arriving at the scene along with Sheriff Keith Brown. Within three or four minutes, they were literally there. Keith Brown, he and I have known each other since we were in grade school. Uh, we actually graduated high school together in the same class. He was there immediately. He asked me if I was all right. I said, you know, Keith, I can feel everything. I just can't move because this stuff's on top of me. So he wasn't sure how bad he was hurt, and I'm not sure that I made it any better. And I said, well, you've got blood all over you. I didn't even recognize you right off. Workers clear the debris. Then EMTs attempt to lift Doug at 250 pounds onto a small board in order to transport him to the ambulance. Well, they showed up with a board that was about six or eight inches wide, and I immediately told them, I said, guys, I'm not a small guy. My wife and I sitting here have survived this tornado. I don't want you dropping me and killing me. So go get two more guys and a bigger board. I can't say enough good things about how the EMTs were and how everybody handled the tragedy. Because that wasn't a drill. That was the real life, and they handled it beautifully. Besides the cuts and bruises, I had a fractured pelvis. I had three broken ribs. I had stitches galore. Um, but I was alive. Six people on Doug and Stacy's block are killed by the tornado, including 22-year-old Jalen Farrell, who was found near a fire hydrant on Water Street, where the twister had carried her. She was 100 yards from her home. That was very difficult. In a small community, in something like the Sevens, it's, it's people you know, families you know. There were people everywhere, the other family members. Some of them were there trying to find their family members. It turned into a very horrible long day. Patty and DJ get the tragic news as they're searching for their daughter. I was just giving her description to anybody, to anybody that was there, you know, what she looked like, um, just to help look for her. Finally, someone suggests they try the funeral home. We went to the funeral home and we saw her. There wasn't hysterics, there wasn't a panic because we are so secure in our faith that I knew that God was with her. And so I just had this peace about me that he was with her, that whatever happened, he would be with us. Then when DJ and I left, I mean, the only thing we knew to do was go to church. So we went straight to church, and um, our pastor, he was there. And we hugged, we prayed, we cried, because that's, that's where we needed to be. You just have to keep on pushing on, because it uh, really don't get any easier. It's, it just gets longer further away. Of all the people that, that were in there, that was the, the hardest to understand. Well, give me a minute. Sorry. We were the only ones in those last three units to live. Everybody else passed away. Don't know why. A total of 15 people are killed in the two-day outbreak. The 26-mile path of the Leap Day tornado destroys hundreds of homes and businesses. By the fall of 2012, the duplexes where Doug and Stacy lived are rebuilt. It was late September when we moved back, and my wife was adamant about moving back to the very same place to, to kind of beat this thing, if you will. Four years later, on February 29th, 2016, 
the first leap day since the deadly tornado, the community gathers to remember. People lost their lives, you know, because of a storm. And for no other reason. They went to sleep just like we did that night. And then the next morning, they're gone. It's real important to remember that because you don't ever want to let that go. We don't go on in the same way. I mean, our lives were changed forever that day. And it's hard. Well, I think all of us, I mean, we don't want our loved one to be forgotten. I mean, we still want their names out there. In the end, 6,000 volunteers come to help rebuild Harrisburg and restore the community to what it was before the tornado. People came from everywhere. It was just an outpouring from the region. It took three weeks to clean up, and it took years to rebuild. So it brought a lot of things to bear in the community and, and I think made it a stronger community as well. Everybody just pulled together and that was encouraging. You always hear the old adage that the worst of times bring out the best in people. It happened. Yeah.